Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the legal and government correspondent. I'm an attorney here in Hudson, but uh, we're not on the legal subject so much today as we are uh, government and politics. My uh, guest today is Shannon Zimmerman. Shannon, welcome to the show. Jamie, thank you so much for having me. You bet. Now, Shannon, you've been my guest. I think this is our, at least our third, if not fourth, I, interview. Yeah. And uh, so you've been a candidate, and that's what it's that season again. You are the very first interview. Um, uh, as we speak, we haven't held the primaries, but you have no primary this year. That is correct. And you're running for the 30th Assembly District. That is correct. And you've held that position now for one full term. So two years ago at this time, yep. you were actually campaigning hard in a primary. I was, I was, and uh, got to meet so many fantastic people in the process, you know, having been a business owner in the area, but occupied doing that, uh, maybe consumed doing that, one could argue. Uh, I didn't necessarily have the, the time, if you will, or, or, or make the commitment to, to, to engage those in the community uh, quite to that level. What a wonderful journey it's been. That was exciting during the primary and moving on to the general. So, uh, yeah, I mean, when I go in the stores now, it's just so nice to see people and, and talking about their kids and, and, and there's the sports going on in the area. I love it. Well, what we're doing, I, people probably saw me hit the timer. I, we want to be fair in these. Yeah. So we're giving each candidate uh, 30 minutes. And there's so many areas we will try to cram this in because I know the time flies. So let's start with reminding the folks of your background. Sure. Okay. Okay, so um, my, my wife and I live in River Falls, Wisconsin. My kids are live in River Falls, Wisconsin. Um, backing up in, uh, oh my gosh, it was uh, 1997, January of 1997. We, uh, we started a business from our living room uh, in River Falls. And, you know, like many businesses, we, you, they had grand dreams. Um, you know, in full disclosure, both my wife and I come from, you know, rural Wisconsin, and uh, we didn't have much, and that's, a, that's saying a lot, actually. We, uh, we probably didn't have anything. In fact, I, I, I still remember our, our very first apartment after getting married. It was, it was above a, a, a slaughterhouse, and uh, <laughs> uh, that is a time that you never forget, and it, it inspires you to, uh, to, to, to work hard. So in 1997, we started a business from our living room in River Falls. Uh, we were very blessed uh, on the journey. We were able to grow that company uh, dramatically uh, over the, the, the past 20 plus years. That company, uh, it, it's changed a few forms. We, we quote unquote sold it uh, last year, but I still am directly responsible for all operations of that company. And we have uh, well over 100 employees uh, that work for us there. And we've started a second business a few years back outside of River Falls. It's a winery, uh, a little bit more of a fun business, uh, certainly, than the language translation industry that I've been a part of. But uh, yeah, so I've, I've been in business my entire career, um, where so common sense prevails. I business, hope. you mentioned a wife. And, yep. And, and married uh, how long? 28 years. Okay. Yeah. And you have uh, two boys and grandchildren, I understand. I do. Um, yes. I, you know, I became a father very young. Was not necessarily planned, but what a blessing. And, and I have two boys. Uh, both of them, like I said, live in the community. Uh, I have four, my wife and I have four grandchildren. We have three little girls and a boy. Uh, nine, two at six, and one at uh, will be two here in about a week. And are they near the 30th Assembly District? They, they all live here. Okay. Uh, so, so these are... Our, my family uh, lives, uh, you know, shops, goes to school, all here in the 30th Assembly District. So matters that affect the 30th, I have not only personal stake in, but my family has stake in well. Well, and, and given talking about your background makes sense on some of the issues we talked off camera about why you're running for re-election. We're going to get to that. Okay. But before we do, let's talk about the last two years because mm -hmm. you went from private sector, uh, really not much involvement in the political game. You were not um, right. like a long-term political party hack or anything like that. No, no, not at all. In fact, um, I, I say this kind of with affection these days. Had you asked me in 2015, uh, can you see yourself serving in government? I probably would have kind of looked at you with a puzzled look and said, why? Why would you subject yourself um, to that, maybe that level of, 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 of scrutiny and challenge and, and, and you look at the, the national level right now, it, it's awful what, what right. certainly happened. But as fate would have it, life sometimes intervenes and these curves uh, are presented in front of us. And, um, you know, when I was first approached uh, about running for this seat, uh, I took over a month. My wife and I, you know, we prayed on it. We talked a lot about it. We talked with our family, our friends. And for me, really, I looked at it this way. Um, I come from a world where common sense prevails. 
and you do what's right, and you do what's right not only by yourself, by your employees, by your neighbors, uh, by those in the community. And so I really viewed this as an opportunity uh, to apply, hopefully, uh, the good skills I've picked up over time in terms of how to grow a business um, really from a shoestring, uh, how to manage finance, how to, how to lead people, how to inspire people, how to make decisions that sometimes may be tough, but they need to be made. So for me, um, this is not uh, an endeavor that I will do forever. It's an endeavor that, that I'm engaged in and I'm passionate about right now because I want to make a, a, pro, a, a positive difference on this community and it needs it because right now, if you look at the dynamics of Hudson, River Falls, Roberts in this area, uh, it's growing like crazy. And that presents a host of maybe we would argue high quality challenges. But I really feel that, that you know, the background of the, that I have to bring is well aligned uh, for this community in this area and at this time. Okay. So let's talk about the last two years in terms of what happened in the legislature. What would you consider some of your highlights and maybe a low light? So okay. let's start with the highlights. Well, that's a good question because there's obviously going to be both. Um, some of the highlights. Um, look, I, um, I love the fact that we eliminated three taxes uh, in the state of Wisconsin. I personally love the fact that, you know, uh, the first bill I passed was actually the elimination of uh, an unrealistic fee uh, applied to uh, uh, foreign businesses that want to invest in Wisconsin. We're the we were the only state in the nation that, that had this surcharge of a fee for these companies that wanted to do that. And so, you know, I drafted legislation that removed that. It's just one more thing to continue to foster and enhance uh, this economic climate here in Hudson River Falls and in, in, in the area. So I, I'm very proud of the tax changes that were made. Um, I'm very proud that we, you know, we balanced the budget, made sure that we've, we've taken care of the state's checkbook. I am thrilled that we were able to make strategic investments in education. Um, you know, education, certainly K through 12, you know, I'm a huge proponent these days of creative ways to help address our workforce challenge. I, when this question comes up, when the question of workforce comes up, invariably, I gravitate pretty quickly to education because education at all levels is a direct feeder system into our workforce and the needs that we have there, our employers, our local companies. And so I thought that was wonderful uh, in terms of what we were able to do there. We also continued to help, uh, uh, for example, the university level be affordable for students. Uh, tuition was frozen again uh, for the period, uh, but I also believe there's a number of creative things that we can be doing, we can maybe talk about them in a bit, that can continue to make that, uh, that process, that structure better, both for the students, for the schools, and for private sector business. So those are gonna be some of, you know, maybe the, the, the highlights. Um, well, in addition, and this one is maybe also very personal and local, I'm really proud of some of the bills that we pass uh, that relate to the HOPE agenda. This is, this is our fight against the opiate and drug epidemic that sadly is affecting not only the state, but our community. As a local resident, I have firsthand experience and exposure to some of these issues. And, and you know, uh, even within our own family, we've had you know, people who've struggled with this. So, People shouldn't have to suffer in silence. We as a state can do a better job of also addressing that epidemic issue. So I was thrilled uh, that we were able to make some changes. In fact, in Hudson, Wisconsin, we passed a bill that allowed for the use of Narcan, both within law enforcement. Narcan is an antidote to an overdose, certainly of, of uh, opiates. And um, within one week of that passing and after the Hudson Police Department uh, were, were, were equipped with it, um, it saved a life. And, and while on one hand you say, boy, it's too bad that, that it's that prevalent, but man, we saved a life uh, and, and so forth. So those are some of the highlights. I think the biggest low light uh, when I reflect back on, on the past session, the budget took far too long. You know, our state budget, you know, drives a lot of things. And, and it, there, there was a lot going on uh, in this first session for me. And to me, you know, we need to operate government with a degree of efficiency. It's it should be expected of us to do that. Mm -hmm. And the budget, which probably and arguably should have been done before the 4th of July, very sadly went out into September. And there was some, uh, I will say, uh, maybe some debates back and forth uh, among leadership at the Senate, the governor's office, and within the assembly. And, um, you know, potentially we put at risk 
schools' ability to, you know, to, to make the ads they need to add and, and, and other government agencies. So I think that, uh, to me, uh, that didn't reflect well. I think we can do a better job. Well, there. what does that say about within the Republican Party? Because the Republicans controlled both houses. Yeah. It wasn't like a situation they have in Minnesota where this is kind of a biannual thing there yeah. where it's the Dems or the Republicans, one holding the other hostage and so forth. Here it was two fellow Republican leaders not being able to see eye to eye yeah. um, and having uh, you know potential victims being whether it's school districts or whoever because sure. we're we have you know budgets we're already into we have to start our budget on July right. 1st so right um, what how did you see th that is that just a sign of the times as far as where we're at on the polarization even within one party or <laughs> Polarization, there's a word that certainly applies these days. Um, you know, I, I think that, look, in some ways, uh, it's natural and normal that there's going to be disagreements, not only, you know, with the separate parties, but within parties. And civil discourse, maybe these days, isn't so civil, but it should be. You know, the rules that govern personal relationships, business relationships, they also should apply in government. You still should be able to debate one another in a constructive, healthy, positive way, but most importantly, get to a result. Get to a finished result here. So while I was frustrated, and I referred to it maybe as a low light because of the duration of time, that's probably just the entrepreneur business person coming out in me. Right. It just seemed excessive, and so I reflect back on it adversely. When you're a self-employed businessman, if you want it done, you just get it done. You have you, to. Yeah. People. People who, who work for our organization, you know, we need to make decisions so that they can get their paychecks, so they can make their rent or their mortgage payments, or so that they can pay for the soccer fees for their children in our community. So I take it very seriously, you know, as, as, as in my position. So I think that that's something, that when we look back, we can improve upon it. But the fact that it extended so that we could continue a good, healthy debate, that aspect of it, I, I can't be too distraught about because we should be doing more reasonable talking and less shaking our fingers and screaming at one another okay. everywhere. A couple things before we get to talk about why you're running for re-election. First is uh, two years ago at this time, you were a private businessman from on the outside looking in yep. and already admitted a non-political insider. Yeah. So um, how does the whole system uh, work? Someone said once likened making legislation to making sausage. You don't want to see the process, yeah. but you've seen the process. So um, w any surprises or uh, hope for the people who are on the outside looking in? You know, the, 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 maybe the level of complexity was a bit of a surprise. And, and you, you have to keep in mind, when you get to Madison, they don't have a playbook for you. And, and so that's okay. Uh, you know, I consider myself a big boy. I'll figure things out quickly. And I, and I think it didn't take me long to do that. Um, but I, I think the complexity maybe was, was a bit surprising, but you get through that pretty quickly. Um, I think that there's tremendous hope for the future. I mean, my general belief and, and, and my hope is this. I think that we can do a better job both at the state level and hopefully nationally, but, but, but I'm focused on Western Wisconsin primarily and certainly the state of Wisconsin more broadly. And I see some great people in Madison. And I think it's important that we let the residents of District 30 know there are some fantastic human beings that represent the state in Madison. There are also some people, if I'm candid about it, it's time to go. Uh, I think that they're there maybe for reasons that aren't necessarily as pure as it, they, maybe they, they intended it to be. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not going to judge. Right. But I think that um, of the good ones, what I find most often is that they're selfless. It's about serving uh, those in their community. They want to do a job and go home. And, and I tell people this all the time. Um, it's a four-hour drive for me one way. It, it, it takes some time. Uh, it's consuming. And so I'm doing this to deliver results and then one day hand this baton or, or you know, conclude my term and somebody else will step up and I hope that they too don't view sitting in the legislature as the greatest accomplishment they'll ever make in their life because it's not. The greatest thing I've ever been hopefully is a husband and a father. Behind that would be uh, a business person in the community, a coach in the community. Uh, those are the things I want to be known for, not you know my time So in you're saying it's, it's really not as bad as what people might see. They see the, the, you know, the fights maybe between the Senate leader and the House leader and so yeah. forth. But um, overall, you think that people are, are there to do a job. Some maybe have overstayed their welcome, so to speak. Yes. But uh, in, in the long run, you, you hope to get something accomplished. 
And before we talk about that, though, yeah. I also want to talk about this other little thing that happened in the last two years, and that is you ran for the Senate. I did. Now, you went through a primary process there. Yep. That was your second primary in 18 yeah. months. Yeah. And uh, you did not get the nomination, mm -hmm. um, and now you're working with a Democratic senator. So yeah. how is that working out? And what, what did that Senate race, special Senate race, how did that impact how you work as a legislator? Well, first of all, the motivation even to consider it um, is, is really rooted in, in what was my earlier point. It's about making a difference. And, and if you can, if you, if you will, from a Senate seat, have a little greater sphere of influence, I, I certainly was open to that because I want to make a difference uh, and leave a very positive impression on the district and so forth. Uh, so, so no regrets there, um, you know, as I, I think this is attributed to Mark Twain. You know, 20 years from now, you know, you'll regret more of the things you didn't do than the things you did so I you know I, I, I subscribed to that uh, took the opportunity that said um, you know working with Senator Schachner I, I have found very quickly we share a lot of uh, some of the same interests number one we both care tremendously about mental health issues and the effects that that's having on our particular area and the state uh, more, more broadly I think that and, and I believe she agrees there's a tremendous amount we can be doing um, proactively because the effects of mental health and the effects of drug abuse and some of those issues, they're profound once you get downstream. So why not invest in, in, in our time and our energies and our attention upstream to address them sooner so that they don't turn into big issues? So you know, early on, I'm finding that there is absolutely topics that there's middle ground. Um, and, and I'm very positive and optimistic for the future. So I again echo this point. I, I think that what we see when we turn on the national television, regardless if you have a political affiliation or not, it is a theater unlike anything you've seen. And I just encourage people, get to know your legislatures, get to know these people, and don't necessarily believe the five second sound bite you hear on TV at 6 p.m. at night. Okay, so uh, this has to be asked because the next segue was why you're running for re-election. And I'm just going to throw it out there. Are you running for re-election just so that then you can run for that Senate seat again that you've already run for once? No, I mean, look, I am solely focused on a couple different hot topics for me. Uh, they are uh, economic development, workforce, and education. Those are the three things that, ha not only before I first ran, but now that I've started, I have full appreciation for, I'll say, the mechanics of this. There's fantastic opportunities in there. Uh, and I'm focused on delivery. So I, I, I am... <laughs> I, I'm in a heck of a race right now, and I'm working hard. I, I'm, I'm already active, and I will continue to be active right to the end. So I'm focused on delivery now. I have not set my sights one day past November 6th. Okay. So this isn't uh, stepping ladder or step no, ladder no. Um, politics. All right. So let's look at those issues, take them one at a time, um, because they are closely related, economic development, workforce, mm -hmm. and uh the education. So I'll let you pick. Which one do you want to talk about first? And uh, let's talk about uh, workforce because workforce can can quickly really um, tie into them both. So I think maybe that's a good one to start with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so drive through Hudson, drive through River Falls. Um, I talk to the businesses in our community. Uh, I meet with uh, an array of people in the area. I'm, I'm an employer in the area. We have open jobs right now in our company that we can't fill. And the same story is happening everywhere across the district right now. Now, you could say, well, that, that, that's a good problem to have. And I don't disagree in theory that low unemployment, actually all-time record low unemployment now in the state of Wisconsin is a good thing, but it's a problem because employers are resourceful. When, when we can't find employees to take our jobs and we've exhausted all measures, the extreme situation is we might look elsewhere. We don't want that to happen. So... With my background and, and what I've learned thus far in the legislature, I think that we have a great opportunity. And by look elsewhere, you mean the business would relocate to another Could be. Location. I mean, that, okay. that again, that's an extreme yeah, uh, right. outcome that we don't want to see happen. But I think that the, the winds and, and, and the conditions are favorable here right now for a kind of a creative resolution to, to what's going on here. So I'm a believer that humans are very predictable in a few things. I've watched it in business, and, and they respond to pain or pleasure here. So let's talk about pleasure for a second. I was moved over Ways and Means and assigned as a subcommittee chair in a special task force to look at tax reform for the state of Wisconsin. The speaker appointed me to this. I'm grateful to do that. It was a strong interest of mine. And, and I have a theory that I think would, would play out very nicely. I think we can help solve our workforce problem in the following ways. Number one, 
if we were to materially or, you know, or, or even completely eliminate our state income tax, we would favor our retirees and the elderly who are on fixed incomes, uh, where, where tax is so important, you know, in terms of, of, of impacting their, their ability sometimes to do the things that they want or need to do. We would also have, a, in, in doing so, have an incentive for our graduates to take jobs in the state of Wisconsin. Number three, employers, look at some of the model states who have done this. Employers start to look to those areas because they know workforce is going to be moving there selfishly because more of their money is theirs. And so I think the entire ecosystem could be favored in this manner. That's just one way we attack workforce. Education is also another, and it's a huge one. And by education, I'm not just talking about university graduates. I was thrilled, you know, I, I, I've spent countless visits both at Hudson High School, River Falls High School. I don't think people in our neighborhoods know or understand how advanced these schools are nowadays. A freshman at Hudson and River Falls is two examples. Entering that school, they can graduate with not only a high school diploma, but they can graduate with, with an associate degree. They are immediately employable to all of those who are hiring right now. We need to be taking not only greater advantage of that, we have to be fostering and, and enhancing that. That's wonderful that they do that. In Hudson, they have the Hudson Raider uh, Works Program. These students aren't doing the shop that I used to do, right, where we'd make something fancy and, you know, learn our, some shop skills. They're actually doing projects for local employers. And the teachers aren't necessarily the ones doing all the communication with the local employer. The students are. So they're learning not only the technical skills to weld and to do some of these sort of things in the trades, but they're learning to communicate. And that's also a very valuable skill. Maybe it's a lost skill in, in the days of everybody looking at their phones, if you will. But I'm so impressed with what's going on there. So when you add in those two pieces, and then you just look at the natural beauty and attraction of Hudson and River Falls, you look at the things going on at our dog track, the businesses that are booming and bustling here, I think that there's a golden opportunity right now. And we are. We're the leading and the fastest growing district in the state of Wisconsin right now. So my job is to make sure that Madison, Milwaukee, the larger metropolitan areas, they know and recognize that Hudson, River Falls, Roberts, and North Hudson, we are the rising star in the West. And we have certain needs that also need to be met. And I think that there's things we can do to positively address workforce, positively favor education, and in doing so, continue a robust economic environment that we have today. Okay. Uh, so have you said education? I wanted to give Please. you a fair opportunity there yeah. um, because you've already mentioned some of these things happening at the yep. local high schools and so forth. What other ideas do you have on education? So a uh, couple things. First of all, I think that we need to remove some of the barriers that exist currently in, 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 the, in law. Um, at the university level, there are, are certain just just financial and fiscal barriers that exist that actually to some degree limit the interaction between private sector business and uh, this higher education institution. I use the word liberate when I say this. I think we need to liberate our, uni our, our universities, the, the River Falls of the world, the Stout, the Eau Claire's, meaning that I think they should be given a bit more autonomy to engage in a more proactive and deeper way the local businesses within the area. I'm talking about going beyond internship. But I'm also talking about employers who very probably are willing to write checks for the services that these universities or their students can provide. What a win-win that is. Not only is the, is the university now deriving a new revenue stream that we need to make sure it can get to faculty and the teachers who are actually teaching these programs, the student involved is learning hands-on, real-world, developing those skills that they can later apply. And, and, and our employer now in the area is, is having their needs met. I have firsthand experience. I contacted the University of River Falls looking for some software uh, engineering help. We were willing to write a check. Not that simple. We had to write a check to the foundation. Well, the foundation doesn't necessarily fund some of the other things that, that are required here. So it's just uh, the process and the current structure, I believe, is opportune for some change that is more conducive to an integrated education and employment system. Because when you're talking education, especially in our district, we've got um, some uh, very good high schools. Yep, outstanding. And, and uh, then we, but we also have a higher ed institution at UW River Falls, and there are some I would argue that um, one uh, there's been a benefit to the K-12 program in the last budget, yep. not so much, and that they tend to get pitted against each other. What do you say to that? 
the lines that delineate sometimes, I think, our educational categories of the past may start to gray a little bit, I think, as time goes by. That's just a prediction. The, the comment I made a moment ago, right, about leaving high school with not only a high school degree but an associate degree, that's evidence right there of that happening. But it's happening because the market's demanding it. The world we live in is changing in a way, and we need to adapt and embrace it and not fight it and just you know keep the old barriers that maybe once were there. So my answer to you is I do think that the lines between some of these institutions will continue to get gray. Let's not forget our technical colleges in there as well. Um, all of these institutions, I think, play a vital, not a thing, they absolutely play a vital role. I think the opportunity for us right now is to think about how they interact with private sector business. Look, 90, probably 9% of the students who graduate from the technical college and, and from the university are, are pursuing those educations to obtain empl employment, right? That, that's what they're doing it for. Some will go on to, uh, maybe from a, a research one school or maybe even some of these schools are gonna go on and, and invest their, their careers in, in research to, to cure cancer and to do other great things for our world and God bless them. But by and large, education is about enabling employment and I think that as we go forward we're going to be able to start to blend these things a bit more together in doing so we'll be more efficient uh, we'll be more effective and I think that we'll also uh, provide great benefit to those faculty and staff inside those schools I know it's tough for them right now I, I know it's a difficult environment uh, from a salary standpoint um, and I think that there's things we can do there to also positively affect that yeah and that's good because I think innovation is great and you can um, do things like improving quality of life and so forth, but in the end, it comes down to more resources. Yeah. And uh, when it, talking about the education, the K-12 and the categorical aid that was increased in this last budget yep. that you got to be a part of. Yep. But the three legislators, legislatures before you mm -hmm. um, severely reduced that and yeah. constrained that. Do you see that once the governor, if the governor is reelected, that he's going to go back to the way he was treating education in his first term as governor, or is it going to be more of what we saw in the last two years since you were in the legislature? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'll tell you, and I can't, I wouldn't want to speak for Governor Walker, but here, here's what I, 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 I hope, I guess, happens. Um, I mentioned uh, workforce a moment ago. I'm going to say it this way. I think workforce, if I'm sizing up the, the, the strengths, weaknesses, and, and you know, opportunities and threats uh, within an organization, a company, and I kind of use that philosophy right now uh, and apply it to our state, our greatest opportunity and our greatest threat is workforce, okay? And so education to me is paramount in this equation. So I'm gonna selfishly answer it this way. My hope is that we continue to invest strategically in education. And I love to use the word invest because when you invest, you have an expectation of return. Right. I have an expectation of return from the great students of Hudson and River Falls, the technical colleges and the university. Come take our jobs. You know, live here, enjoy this wonderful community. You know, I think part of the difficulty of living here, uh, so close to the Twin City Metro, is there's been decades of just behavioral conditioning that tells our youngsters, and maybe some of even our, uh, the adults in the community, I have to go into the Twin Cities to, to, to get my job. That's not true. You can, you can make a wonderful wage in Hudson, in River Falls, uh, in all of our communities these days. And I just think it's gonna take a few more years of that uh, to, to, to let that condition set in. But education is a vehicle to get it done. All right, and so you've made that one of your top three issues, and, and I've heard you, even when you were the primary candidate two years ago, tell it the same thing. And I appreciate that, especially coming, it's not just a, a, a one-party idea, all yeah. right? So, but the problem is, the state budget is a pie, all right? And um, when we are constantly looking for ways to eliminate taxes and yep. reduce taxes, the pie gets smaller, right. creating the competition. So the only way that education can get the resources that it needs to do all these great things that you want it to do right. is we gotta look at these other things that are not in your top three, yep. like um, our high incarceration rate and, yep. and spending more in prisons and the, the totally ballooning healthcare that um, our state has taken yeah. on because it refused the federal program. Right. And infrastructure, right. you know, uh, we are experiencing tons of, so how do we uh, reduce those things then, which, you know, uh, arguably are pretty important to some people as well, and in order to promote education. So yeah. how do you see that They're competition? very important. And when I think of infrastructure, I'll take it one step further, it's beyond transportation to me. Infrastructure to me is also access to 
quality broadband. And that, that's all infrastructure to me these days and the things that we depend on daily. Um, and you're right, okay? So, so the big three uh, for me are certainly very important, but they're not meant to, to dismiss the others. I hope we don't live in a world where it, it's one or the other, right? In an ideal situation, we're able to balance uh, things effectively so that we can, we, can, we can move monies around where needed and where prioritized. But here, here's the simple way that I look at this. You're right, I'm not, you know, I was elected, uh, I don't believe to raise taxes. But I do believe I was elected to find creative ways to increase revenues without raising taxes. And I think that there are ways that we can appeal again to the workforce, on uh, the workforce and tax issues, where we become a destination for more workers. Okay, let, right there I gotta stop you because we got 30 seconds left. Oh. And I promised that you <laughs> would be able to talk about Foxconn because you know that that's uh, obviously an, it was an We're issue that separate, that. it separated you and your Senate uh, uh, primary opponent. Yep and probably your opponent in this election as well. Yeah. So how do you see that uh, as something that you could be proud of and you think right. is a plus in your I sense? I said in every committee hearing, I did vote for it and I'll tell you why, is that we mm -hmm. can look at this solely as an expense uh, to the state of Wisconsin because we provided a tax credit. There's a couple things you need to know. First of all, Wisconsin will not pay $1 until Foxconn has paid its share into the state, hired our employees and made direct investments in the state of Wisconsin. And so what we hear from the opposition is they look, they talk solely about the expense. It's a $3 billion commitment. Uh, and, and my point is, or any income statement I've ever looked at, you can't just look at your expenses, you have to look at your revenue as well. It's for a $10 billion direct investment, 13,000 jobs. They just uh, made a major investment in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and we're not even talking yet about the ripple effect or the clustering of peripheral companies and suppliers that will come around Foxconn. I personally lived structurally this process in Little River Falls, Wisconsin in 2004 when the state of Wisconsin provided our business a $50,000 tax credit to create 30 jobs. We would go on to create 130 in that community. They held up to their end of the bargain, we held up on ours. Having companies like this, high tech, liquid crystal display manufacturers, this is the first non-Asian location for this. This is gonna be good for the state of Wisconsin and will actually, I think, be beneficial for decades to come. All right, with that, we have to stop there, but I gave you your chance to finish the, the answer. Thanks it. for coming on. Gee, thank you very much, I appreciate it. And appreciate being the, the number one uh, guinea pig here for our political <laughs> season. But, and I wanna thank our viewers for joining us for another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal, and please remember to get out and vote this fall.